Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Wheeler Centre this evening. My name is Sophie Black, and I have the great pleasure of having a very, very timely conversation with Anna Goldsworthy, the author of the latest quarterly essay, the 50th quarterly essay, in fact, Unfinished Business, Sex, Freedom and Misogyny. Now, Anna is the author of mem the memoirs Welcome to Your New Life and Piano Lessons. She's a prolific writer and she also happens to be a concert pianist. So a round of applause, first of all, for the terribly accomplished Anna Goldberg. <laughs> Uh, now, before we start, if I can just remind everyone to turn their phones off. I think I've remembered to do the same. Um, now, I'm going to start with the now former Prime Minister's words from Wednesday. Now, I'm sure they're burnt into everyone's brains, but I think that they bear repeating for this discussion. The reaction to being the first female Prime Minister does not explain everything about my Prime Ministership, nor does it explain nothing about my Prime Ministership. It explains some things, and it is for the nation to think in a sophisticated way about those shades of grey. So let's have a go at those shades of grey, shall we, Anna? How well, do you think the national discussion is faring so far? <laughs> In terms of shades of grey? Yes. I think some, some aspects of the national discussion are certainly exploring a few more shades of grey than, than others. Some of the coverage, I think, of Wednesday night and the events before Wednesday night has been superb. You know, I'm thinking of Annabelle Crabb and Lee Sales, mm. their, their, their live coverage. And in some ways, the beauty of that whole situation, the fact that they had to wait so very long for Kevin Rudd to come and deliver his speech, allowed them to tease out a few of those shades of grey and, and allowed us to hear a sort of nuanced political discussion that went beyond the, the very sort of polarised black and white approach that, that so many tend to favour. Um, I think there was a terrific article by Catherine Murphy in The, in the Guardian about uh, Julia Gillard's whole Prime Ministership, mm -hmm. and I think that very sort of briefly teased out a few of those shades of grey. So I think we are capable of looking at them. Um, I, I don't know if the whole nation is uh, partaking of that particular scrutiny at present, but it would be delightful if it were. Now, we won't spend the entire discussion on Julia Gillard, but I think we need to spend a little bit of time. There are so many themes that you touch on in this essay, and we will get to them. But... Not everyone was interested in the sort of shades of grey around Gillard's now famous misogyny speech uh, that she made in Parliament, Parliament. It seems like a world ago now. But why do you think that speech and that use of that very dangerous word, misogyny, struck such a chord? I think, I suppose that's, that's largely what I'm trying to explore in this essay. It did certainly strike a chord, and I think there are a number of reasons for that. We live in a society that might look superficially uh, like being a post-feminist society. You know, wonderful changes have happened over the course of one or two generations. When I look at the privileges that we have, we're extraordinarily lucky. You know, if I, if, I look at, if I look at the fights that my, my mum, who's here tonight, had to go through in order to get where she is, and I compare them to the, the much more easy road that, that, that I've had, it is significant, and I think we do need to start off by being really grateful for that. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't hope that, you know, in 30 years' time, if, if we had daughters, they'd be sitting here thinking, thinking to themselves, well, thank God we're, we're alive now and not 30 years ago. And I think perhaps... Certainly, I hadn't considered that um, as much as I, as I might have. And, and in some ways, um, Julia Gillard's misogyny speech, I think, forced us to, to examine that. And, and the results of that examination were, again, strikingly polarised. There were those who... Well, there are a number of conversations, I think, that it precipitated. One was, is Tony Abbott a misogynist, yes or no? Um, I think there has to be a response to the speech that goes beyond that. Um, one of which is, why did it have this effect? Mm. And uh, what, what Julia Gillard said to me is that she thought women sort of recognised um, these words or, or they, they wished that they'd had the opportunity to use these words. And then that brings up the whole issue of, are you allowed to call out sexism or misogyny when you see it? Or, or by doing so, are you deploying that terrible, legendary, mythological gender card um, that somehow apparently cancels all argument and is not fair play. 
Um, I think we have to be able to. I think we have to be able to call it when we see it. I think we have to be able to say this is sexist. Um, whether we describe sexism as misogyny is, is another issue, um, an issue about words. But, but that I think was one reason um, for the re for the response. Some commentators suggested that to suggest Gillard had experienced forms of misogyny was delusional. I think I'm quoting Jared Henderson there. <laughs> I think his, I, th I think if I remember his exact quote was that if anybody, uh, if anybody attributes, well this isn't his exact quote, but I think the gist of it was that if anybody tries to claim that her political problems are the result of misogyny, they are delusional. Um, but again, to say that she has been on the receiving end of both sexism and misogyny is not the same as saying that that explains her entire prime ministership, as she indeed spelt out. And it's very easy to try to back your opponents into a corner and say this must be your position. But she's done all these other things wrong too. Well, maybe she did some other things wrong as well, but that in no way negates the fact that she was absolutely on, on the receiving end of some really foul treatment. It was unusual her, for her to acknowledge that in such an overt way though, wasn't it? Um, you write about the fact that Gillard was sort of the female epitome in some ways of just getting on with it. Mm. She would just simply get on with the job and hope that that was enough, mm. that that record of doing rather than being. And she has expressed frustration at that herself, at, at the fact that the minute um, a prominent woman comes to any kind of attention, she ceases to be about what she's doing and she becomes about what she is or she becomes about being. So is that part of why this struck such a chord? Because she had avoided the conversation around the, around the fact that she was female, she'd brushed, brushed it aside until then? Yeah, I, th I think that is partly it. Um, I, think, I think, you know, she, she had actually previously said to, to Julia Baird that she was very keen to avoid the, what she described as the golden girl vortex, where mm -hmm. the reporting moves away from what a female politician does to what she is. Um, and it, it almost seems as if her, I, I don't know if it was a deliberate strategy or if it's more just her personality, was absolutely to get on with things. And she did get on with things, didn't she? When you look at how much legislation she managed to pass, she was a, she was a great doer and she's got a fantastic record of doing stuff. And it sort of intrigues me now that there's this conversation that we're going to move away from so-called personality-based politics to, to policy-based politics. Whereas, I mean, to me, Gillard actually represents doing stuff rather than the cult of personality. And, and if we've seen anything in the, couple, in the last couple of days, we've seen the triumph of a, of a cult of personality again over, over that. Um, so I think her strategy was very much to do. Is doing sufficient for a leader? Possibly not. You know, um, leadership demands more than just getting stuff done. It, it does demand the ability to inspire people to to be a symbol. Now she'd resisted being a symbol of something. Um, it's, it's a symbol of the feminine, perhaps. But maybe by extension, she she didn't sort of adequately project herself as a as a prime minister personality. I'm not sure, but but certainly that speech did mark a moment in which she stopped doing for a second, or maybe she started a different sort of doing, and, and we actually caught a glimpse of who she might be and what she might really think and what she might really feel and the fact that she did actually really feel. Um, she made such a point of her stoicism and it was admirable, but sometimes you sort of long to see, see the, the real face behind that. And, and I felt we caught a glimpse of that in the misogyny speech and perhaps that also explains its, some, some of its reception. You unpack some of the words in this essay, some of the words that are aimed at Gillard or were constantly aimed at Gillard. Let's talk about the word shame, for example. Why does this word resonate? Well, now, some would say that shame is not a gender-specific word, and, and it's, not, it's not really. I, I do think, and Germaine Greer has written, I think, really beautifully and extensively upon this, that, that female shame is a loaded concept. And I, I think it's something that we are culturally equipped with, if, if not at birth, at least at, at puberty. And I think it informs a lot of the, the way we, we think about our bodies as women, the lot of the way, a lot of the ways we allow ourselves to exist in public as women. And I, I don't know if it's coincidence that shame was the word that was invoked so frequently by the opposition. Um, I don't know if Alan Jones's comments that uh, Julia Gillard's father died of shame are necessarily gender specific, but as a woman, you hear them, you hear them that way. Why does the word shame resonate with women as a whole, though? What, what does that come back to? What does that speak to, that word shame? 
Where does it come from? Um, anxiety about the female body, perhaps. Uh, anxiety about the, the fact that the female body is somehow our designated cultural sexual site and uh, represents desire. Um, the fact that, uh, you know, women give birth, um, all the kind of bodily reality of, of being female. And I think, to, m to my mind, one of the really useful distinctions that Germaine Greer makes is between the feminine, which is the sort of artifice, the cultural... The, the sort of cultural invention around the female and the actual female, um, which she claims uh, many people find fundamentally grotesque. And, and it seems to me that a lot of what we do is about um, hiding that or um, disclaiming that. Many people accused Gillard in, with the misogyny speech and then subsequent speeches, um, most recently the blue tie speech, uh, accused her of playing the gender card, which you just referred to before. What exactly is the gender card? I think you refer to it, you liken it to kryptonite in this. Well, it sounds really handy, the gender card. I'd really card. like to buy one. If it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> if it, just, if it works as effectively as the people who, who claim, you know, who, who deride its use the claim, yes. then wouldn't it be marvellous to just would. whip it out of your pocket? Hello, I'm a woman. Gotcha. Um, touche. <laughs> Just flash it like a police ID badge yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah look, it's, it's a yeah. tricky thing. I mean, I guess what it implies is that women are demanding some sort of special, special treatment, and um, I don't think that's what we want. And it's very, I think it's, it's, a very, it's a very confusing area. I think being mean to a woman is not necessarily misogyny. Mm. Being rude to a woman isn't necessarily sexism. It's uh, being mean to a woman or being cruel to a woman because she's a woman and you hate women. That's, that's misogyny. Now, if you say, you can't be mean to me because I'm a woman, um, probably that is playing the gender card, mm. you know? But if you say that's a really sexist comment, how can you say that in a way that's not playing this, uh, this sort of fictional gender card? I, I'm yet to discover the way. Do you think that's why many k women keep silent on these sorts of things? In, in yeah, I do. I, I think that's certainly one of the reasons they keep silent. Um, another reason, uh, depending, I suppose, on the context or the, or the situation, but if it's a woman um, ocu you know, living or, or working in a really sort of high-powered masculine sphere, chances are she doesn't particularly want to draw any more attention to her gender than, um, than she has to. I mean, as, as Julia Gillard also pointed out in, in that, I thought, very gracious speech, you know... Um, Everyone's aware that it's there. It's, mm. it's not as if you... It's, but, you know, she doesn't actually want, necessarily want to make a point of it. Um, she's probably socially rewarded for getting on with it, for being one of the boys, for, for being stoical. Um, nobody wants to present as a sort of feminist hysteric. There's, I think there's all these things that actually um, actively dissuade women from saying, no, stop, that's, that's not right. I think uh, it was Miranda Devine who said that it, to play the gender card uh, is against that Australian notion of the fair go. Well, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting how the fair go can be used by anybody in any context. So uh, to say someone's misogynist now, you're suddenly un-Australian, you know, it's, it's not fair dinkum. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but surely surely being sh chauvinist and sexist or misogynist, surely that is fundamentally un-Australian according to this lovely sort of national self-definition we have. And what do you think that suggests to young girls? I mean, young girls have been evoked a lot in the last few days in terms of the suggestion that they would be reluctant to put their hand up to ever, to ever run for politics, for example, mm. because they've watched how the former Prime Minister has been treated. What does this, what does this suggest to them as they, as they watch... The, well, the accusation of playing the gender card, for example, it's, it's thrown around as if uh, girls should somehow say, stay silent. Do, do you think the effect on young girls is overstated? Gosh, I, I don't... Look, I don't, I don't think so. I was mm. a young girl once, you were a young girl mm. once. I think we... I'm sure we internalised some of these things. Mm. I'm sure we internalised some of these scripts. Um... Yeah, I, I don't actually think it is necessarily um, overstated. I, I was quite struck, and in fact, one of the things that inspired me to write this essay was that one thing that really struck me about the reception to the misogyny speech was all these mothers who were tweeting and posting comments on Facebook saying, yay, I sat down with my daughter and I made her watch mm. this. Now, why are they making their daughters watch it? It's because they want these daughters to have this vocabulary. They, they actually want these, these daughters to have access to this particular script, um, which is a script of saying, no, enough. If we stay with sort of daughters and, and young girls and uh, appearance, you, you, you talk about what you refer to as the looking contest in this essay and uh, you talk about this sort of fundamental knowledge that 
or assumption that women is th are there to be looked at and this informs the way we think and the way society thinks about us. And you remember uh, the six-year-old you in the playground and you were playing a sexy legs competition. Can you just explain the sexy legs competition for us? <laughs> <laughs> it's a vague memory. All I remember is a sexy legs competition was declared during recess, I think by some of the boys, and, and they, they sat on the bridge and I thought, oh gosh, what are sexy legs? They sound great, I've got to have some. <laughs> and I just remember you know, doing the high kicks there in my, my clumpy shoes and my, my brown ribbed stockings and cavorting in front of these people, these, these six-year-old boys who had somehow decided we're the judges. And uh, that was, you know, it's when I was six. I, I think we, we do internalise that. Where do we get that from? And how does that knowledge inform the way we act? Where do we get that from? Oh, we get it from the television. We get it from the culture, you know, in, in all of its manifestations. If we're lucky, like I was, we don't get it from our, from our mothers. Um, we get the opposite from our mothers. Um, but uh, we, we get it from, I think, most everywhere else. We get it these days, I think, also um, probably from, from Facebook culture. I think it's, it's quite intriguing to see how this is possibly only furthering a kind of celebration of narcissism. Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it's everywhere. We're, in, we're an image-centric culture, and I don't think that helps our young women. Talking about... Uh, you talk about the early days of the internet, so you, you refer to Facebook, and you talk about the early days of the internet, and you refer to the fact that it was largely text-based. It was quite anonymous mm. for that fact. And for a while, it offered female solace from that idea of being looked at. And it was, in a way, it was like an invisible cloak. Um, you also liken it to other techno technological developments like the car or the pill in that it offered further freedom from our bodies. How does that compare to the internet now? The internet, the internet now, I think, is a vastly conflicted place and it still does offer those things. And it's got many, many tangible ad advantages to women, particularly, you know, mothers isolated at home and, and so on. And it... It's, it's been wonderful for that. It's about mm. connection. It's about getting your voice out there in a kind of semi-public forum. Um, all of these things. And, you know, that's why we have the mummy blogger. Um, but at the same time, there are particular weirdnesses that seem to exist on, on the internet. Um, one of which is the utterly disproportionate amount of um, vitriol that's directed against women on the internet. Now, I don't know if this is a direct... Uh, response, a direct reaction to the fact that the internet perhaps favours traditionally female traits of um, communication and connection and multitasking, or whether it's more widely an indication of what we truly think of women. And on the internet, we have the freedom and the anonymity, if we wish for it, to express those feelings. Facebook, of course, was initially created as a way for college jocks to rate pretty girls. Yeah. Um, what does it mean, do you think, specifically Facebook and not the internet, but for young girls to grow up on Facebook? I think we're yet to see. Um, and it's, it's hard to know, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's got this notion that privacy... It's the end of privacy. And it's hard to know, for those of us who are still somehow connected to the notion of privacy, whether this is just some sort of quaint thing we've inherited and, and maybe we don't need as much privacy as we imagine we do. But then again, maybe we do. Maybe some privacy is, is necessary to selfhood. I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure. I think it's going to take a generation or two. It's going to be fascinating to see what happens. If a whole generation grows up on Facebook, if a whole generation grows up documenting their every move, you know, oversharing stuff, as some might, might say. Um, I don't know if it actually leads to a more open and communicative society um, or if it leads, leads to something else. I suppose one of my concerns about Facebook and the combination of Facebook and, you know, the handheld camera phone is this, uh, this return of, of the image dominating things. I kind of I like Twitter. I mean, Twitter... Um, you know, it's got this haiku quality and it sort of brings you back to the word and this kind of epigrammatic um, thinking, which I, I suppose can be a good thing. Um, and, I, and, and I'm not saying that the image is overwhelmingly evil. In fact, one thing that sort of um, intrigues me is I remember reading years ago, and, and dig as I could, I couldn't find this source, but, mm. but when the television was first invented, there were commentators saying, well, hooray for this, finally. The image, we've been dominated by the word for too long. How, how wonderful to be returning to the image. 
Um, and yet, I suppose from that time, I feel the image and, and particular types of images have really sort of doc have really dominated our popular imagination. And I suspect that aspects of the internet take that even even further, as you photograph all the life out of your of, out of your own existence, and post it. And specifically in terms of Facebook and 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 the image, uh, but, but people refer to. Uh, a sort of narcissism. That narcissism is very much encouraged when it comes to the image and the image on Facebook. But you refer to the fact that narcissism takes different forms for boys and girls on Facebook. Yeah, there was a really interesting study that showed that um, boys and girls use the technology technology quite differently, or young women and young men. And you know, these uh, these the people who had done this survey that somehow identified. Um, using, I suppose, psychological testing, narcissistic young men and narcissistic young women, and narcissistic young women were much more likely to sort of promote themselves using images, whereas narcissistic young men were more likely to boast about their abilities and accomplishments. How damaging is <clears throat> the selfie to, to a young girl's psyche, do you think? Yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe if she's her own paparazzi, it's healthier than having someone else take her photos. She can at least then be her own spin doctor or control control the image that she that she sends out. Um, but when when she then submits that selfie to an Instagram beauty contest and is rated by stu by strangers and and you know maybe doesn't get the nine point five that she was hoping for and only a lowly six point two. I don't know what what does that do to her. She's putting herself out there. I, I personally don't think that's a great thing. How different is that? I mean, I remember. I remember being in high school and the cool... I, was, I went to a girls' school, so the assumption is that you're insulated from some of this and you're insulated from the male gaze. But I remember the cool group um, of girls at school had a, an exercise book doing the rounds. It was swimming day, I think, and this book was discovered and they had rated girls in terms of their hotness. The girls had rated the girls. The girls had rated right. the girls. Mm. So it's not always the male gaze that's to blame. No, it's not it? always the male gaze to blame. And in fact, I think women police beauty just as much as men, um, perhaps in slightly different ways. I think, um, you know, you open up any Glamour magazine and you'll see an, a magazine editor sort of telling women what, what and, and who they should be. And, you know, many, many women, I know myself included, are, are guilty of criticising a woman's appearance when, she turns on the, on, when you turn on the television because she doesn't look like you think someone on the television is supposed to look like. Or and someone like Hillary Clinton would constantly have her hairstyle referred to if she just had it sort of tied back in a ponytail and yeah. nobody was actually listening to what she was saying. Well, that's, that's I think, one of the biggest problems with it. There, there's quite a few problems with it, one, one of which is that, that um, it just drowns out the message. You know, it's just, how does she look? and nothing else really counts. Another problem is the really significant temporal handicap that it represents to be a groomed woman. And, um, you know, I said this to, to a man I know, and he said, no, but women love grooming. Um, well, maybe sometimes, but, you know, every day, constantly, for hours, um, maybe not. Um, and, that, and beyond that, I think, again, that sort of scrutiny of someone like Hillary Clinton, a, a woman of that stature and that accomplishment, Maybe the young women is uh, maybe the effect on young women is being overstated, but I, I just don't really think it is for for them to know that if I want to step out there, I'm going to have my hair criticised all the time and this and that and, and everything else. I suspect it is actually a really strong disincentive to to enter the public sphere and, and try to make really positive changes to the world. You also talk coming back to appearance as well. You talk about the fashion industry. You talk about well, not the fashion industry itself, but fashion and the fact that. Fashion can be an art form, it can be fun, it can be frivolous. But for women, and I think it was Caitlin Moran who said this, fashion is compulsory. Yeah, um, well, make, yeah, she, you know, she said it's something like you can't, it's, it's a, it's, it, might be, it may be a game, but it's a compulsory game yes. and you can't get out of it by faking your period. I know, I have tried. <laughs> Um, which I, I thought was a, a lovely way of putting it. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not maintaining, by, by quoting that, I'm not maintaining that every single woman feels compelled to be a style maven, but I think there, there is this sense when you're a woman that, that every outfit choice you make co comments in some ways about probably your, your sexual availability, um, your status, all, all of these things that, you know, the male uniform, I think, allows men to get away with a lot more neutrality. What about going past, sort of moving past the makeup drawer and, and the wardrobe? 
you also talk about body maintenance. Hair removal, fake tan, waxing, plucking, for jazzling. Mm. How much is this tied into our notion of the erotic? Why are we doing this to ourselves? And where are we getting our ideas of what erotic should look like these days? Um, yeah, well, in terms of, first of all, the way the female body should look, I think we, we can get this from any magazine, any television show, any, anywhere, anywhere we look in popular culture, any rock music video, it's, it's pretty much there on, on display. This is what the female body should, should look like. Um, and many of those cues, though, I think are imported um, from well, increasing, increasingly. And, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not claiming that this emphasis on, on female grooming or, or bodily maintenance is anything new. I just think um, it's, it's reached a new, a new level. Mm. And uh, it seems that a, a lot of the notions of what constitutes a beautiful naked female body, or not, if, not even a beautiful one, just an acceptable one, just one that passes the grade and, and is allowed to, allowed to exist... Uh, these days, these notions are taken from the world of pornography. Mm. Um, and it's a world that I think many people of a certain generation don't realise is truly informing the way our young people um, approach sex and, and sexuality and, and also body image. Coming back to the internet as well, we're, we're blaming the internet for everything. Uh, no, but coming back to the internet and the fact, I think you say that this generation of kids, or t- Young young people um, has witnessed more sex than any in history, uh, and you examine the role of of gonzo porn. Um, can you explain a bit as to what gonzo porn is for for starters? Yeah, I think gonzo porn and its original meaning are uh, just sort of meant a point of view pornography, which is a little usually often perhaps used a, used a handheld camera. Um, but it came to mean a, a very specific genre of pornography that was, um, became increasingly popular in the 90s, which now constitutes the vast majority of the online pornography that's, that's available. And uh, I've, I had the, pr- the privilege of, of speaking to a couple of researchers, Marie Crabb and um, Dave Corlett, who've done a lot of work on this. And... Uh, and for me, actually, writing this essay, it was, it was a great journey because I'd always sort of thought, yeah, pornography, great, fine, anything goes, consenting adults, that's fine, that's good, I'm, I'm not going to be an anti-porn crusader, I'm not pro-censorship and, and so on. But speaking to them um, and getting to know their work and their research, they have interviewed a great number of, of young people from all over the world about their experiences with gonzo pornography and about the effects of this on, on their own notions of, of intimacy. And it's, it's, a, it's a really compelling and quite shocking study. What did it, I mean, what did it reveal? What, what is it about gonzo porn that is so shocking or confronting or, or, da- or damaging if it's, if it's hardwiring our kids' sexuality? Yeah, well, for me, um, I suppose most, most shocking is the incidence of violence against women. And uh, the vast studies have been done, conflicting studies have been done. I I should point this out, and and they've arrived at very different results, mostly dependent upon the researcher's definition of of violence. Now, if you think violence means spitting, strangling, um, striking, abusing, et cetera, then um, gonzo pornography is extremely violent. Much of it is extremely violent towards women. And if these are the norms that our young are internalising... Um, in, a, in a way that we're largely unaware of because, you know, we don't hopefully monitor their sex lives. We're not participants in their sex lives of our children, one hopes. Um, as a consequence, stuff happens there that, that maybe we don't know about. And, and to me, that's one of the fascinating things about this research that, that Crabbe and Corlett have done is they actually manage to cross that intergenerational divide and, and find out what's going on there. Well, moving from gonzo porn to maybe it's, it's opposite... Twilight, or for something a little bit racier, um, Fifty Shades of Grey. What does the popularity of these books um, say about female sex- sexuality, do you think? Why, why do these... Some, some people refer to it as the fetishisation, I can't say it, of virginity um, in some ways. Yeah. What, what does that say about about female desire, for starters, given the popularity of these texts amongst women? Yeah, um, 
I think they're very confusing and um, probably point to the fact that we are all very confused about, about female desire. I think on a very basic level, um, that they, I suppose they're quite different in, in that 50, 50 Shades of Grey is, is quite explicit, sexually explicit, whereas Twilight, uh, the sexuality is all implicit and in fact its writer claimed that she didn't think gratuitous sex was, was necessary or appropriate for, for teenagers for whom the books were uh, essentially written. Um, but Fifty Shades of Grey, one of the things that sort of really struck me is the cultural phenomenon about this book um, is its astonishing success and its astonishing popularity. This is a work of um, erotica, I suppose, or maybe a type of quasi-literary pornography um, that has done remarkably, remarkably well internationally. And not only that, women have read it, women have been prepared to read it in public places, you know, in full knowledge of the fact that everybody knows that as they're reading it, they're, you know, presumably getting their rocks off or getting aroused. Um, it did start, though, as an e-book, didn't it? So yeah, it did. And I think because the very circumstances of its genesis allowed this to be the case, the fact that it was... It began life as a, as a work of fan fiction, um, as a tribute to the Twilight, the Twilight series. And then as it got too racy, its author removed it to a different website and it was published as an e-book. So there was a degree of anonymity at first with which women could both um, purchase this and also, you know, read it with their, with their, I, with their Kindles or their, or their iPads, not giving anything away about the contents to, to the casual viewer. Um, and then somehow it, it achieved so much kind of credibility or popularity that it, it became a paperback in its, in its own right and women all around the world embraced it. So, um, I mean, I find this intriguing because female desire is not something we really consistently celebrate. The, the lustful woman is, is the slag, is the slut. We've got all these words to denigrate female desire or, or female promiscuity for, for which there's no male equivalent. And as a consequence, I think women uh, are not all that comfortable about speaking publicly about the fact of their desire. And, uh, and to my mind, that's an extension of um, the way culturally I think we afford more subjectivity to men than we do to women. Desire is, is certainly a form of subjectivity, sexual subjectivity. And so from that perspective, I actually think, you know, the book probably marks a really positive change. If you try to pass its contents, they're very conflicted and... Um, and somewhat confusing. It, it does, as you say, star a virginal young woman who mm. is deflowered by the classic alpha male, um, and you throw in there some bondage and discipline and various mind games and, and power struggles, and it, it all becomes a kind of weird cocktail. And in the same way, Bella in Twilight is a very different sort of character, but she is resisting this idea of being overcome. She's going to be... She herself will be overcome and, and the her love interest will somehow uh, overpower her and de literally devour her. Yeah. And then there's, by extension, the portrayal of women in, in gonzo porn and this violence against women. And you mentioned the suggestion... I think it's from actually from a porn star in the, the essay that you quote that um, a female... Porn star that, that she says that uh, perhaps it's that men and women alike crave some kind of corrective to women's advancement, and that's where these portrayals are coming from. Yeah, well, um, that that particular line actually was Katie Roth who wrote a response to um, to Fifty Shades that's right. of Grey that that caused a great deal of consternation mm -hmm. and, and aggravation amongst the feminist uh, sort of sorority. Um, but there was a, there, there are several porn stars, um, I've, I've, I've read several porn stars who have suggested that pornography does enact some sort of revenge upon mm. women. Um, and they, and including one, one female, one female porn performer who says she's noticed a real change, particularly in the last decade of increasingly misogynistic betrayals of sex during pornography. Um, now, I don't know if there's a, a casual relationship between that. Uh, well, what the nature of the relationship between that and women's much more, I suppose, visible empowerment in society is, I, I'm not sure. Um, there's one very sa very delightful um, porn star who claims that, um, this, is a, this is a male, who claims that um, pornography offers men sort of the last bastion of, of male empowerment, empowerment because if there's one thing a woman can't do, it's ejaculate in her partner's face. Um, so in that sense, pornography does offer a type of... I, I don't know, would you, would you call that empowerment? I, I'm not quite sure, but um, something maybe to, to a man who, who seeks some sort of revenge uh, upon women. 
And I mean, one of the things that is really curious about gonzo porn is it's almost um, a sort of celebration of what you know is called the, the hate fuck. Now, um, there's one porn star who says, um, this is in an article that Susan Faludi wrote for The New Yorker some years ago, um, and, and this particular man said he just hates women, he just wants to fuck them all to death, and, and that's what he does in his pornography, and he's, he's celebrated for it. Um, but this notion of the hate fuck, mm -hmm. you know, as a woman, I actually can't, I, I don't know if it's a failure of my imagination, but I, I actually can't get my head around wanting to go and hate fuck someone. Um, and yet, gonzo porn sort of predicated seems to me to be partly predicated on this notion, on, on this impulse of, of needing to, to hate fuck. Moving on from the hate fuck to um, another form of, of corrective, maybe, um, a refusal to laugh at women's jokes or the suggestion that you quote, well, we, you quote Christopher Hitchens' infamous essay that suggested that women aren't funny. What is behind the suggestion that women somehow don't have a valid sense of humour and, and aren't as funny as men? Yeah, well, I think women are funny. Mm. Um, Christopher Hitchens, when he writes this essay, it's with this sort of, isn't it so refreshing someone's finally speaking out and telling the truth about this thing that we all knew, ha-ha, um, kind of approach, um, which just inf infuriated me when, when I read that. Um, I think... In many cases, women are discouraged from being funny, and you know many studies have revealed that you know we, we reward our, our daughters, uh, our baby daughters, uh, our toddler daughters for compliance, and we reward our little boys for having character. You know, being the class clown. It's usually the boy who's the class clown, and and even if the teacher pulls uh, pulls his or her hair out um, at the at the antics of the class clown, there's there's still I feel a level of celebration about it. I I, I think it's I think it's internalised. I think it's there at an early age that boys are encouraged to muck around and, and mm. be funnier than girls. And maybe it, maybe it does exist in, in direct relationship to this notion that women or girls, are, you, you know, you aspire to be a good girl when you're a girl, to be compliant, to please. And perhaps in order to crack a joke, you've got to be a little bit subversive, a little bit antic. I, um, I'm and, not and sure. And it, it, um, again, it's sort of against that notion that you're there to be looked at. Mm. Um, how do we how do we arrest that idea of, uh, even at the earliest age in the, as a six year old in the playground? How do we encourage that little girl to look out to be the one doing the looking? Yeah, and I think that's what it amounts to. Finally, um, as as parents, how do we do it? We uh, yeah, I suppose we try to we try to equip her with a voice. We encourage mm. her to to speak up. We laugh if she makes a funny joke, and we don't say shh, shh be a good girl. Mm. You know, all of these things. I think it it takes it requires us to look at what we're saying to her, mm. um, what we're the messages we're giving her consciously or, or unconsciously, what we're rewarding for her, rewarding her for. Mm. Now you you finish up the essay by mentioning the F word. Feminism. Yeah, I managed to avoid it for quite yeah, a few pages. Yeah, you did, you did. <laughs> but uh, but we'll, we'll, we get there in the end. Now, the very the, the definition of feminism is really a very uncontroversial notion, that idea that you are for equal rights for women, basically. I mean, that is the, the pure, purest definition of, of the term feminism. Why do so many women shy away from labeling, labeling themselves as a feminist especially young girls? Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, the definition, I think, is and, and should be straightforward, and yet the definition itself does tend to be fiercely contested. And, mm. and you do hear feminists, feminists saying, no, that's not feminism, this is feminism, mm. and, and no, that's not feminism, this is feminism. And I, I don't know if that is always helpful, but I think um, the fact that young women shy away from the, from the word is, is probably more due to successful anti-feminist propagandists as, as much as anything else who have kind of created this popular notion of the feminist that is many things. Um, you know, we all know the cliche bra burning and man hating and wants to maximise the world's abortions and, and all of this. Um, but more than anything else, the, the feminist is unfunny and uh, worse, worse than that, in, in, you know, according to our, our value system of what a woman should be, she is unsexy. And so young women who, above all, want to be attractive and pleasing, they don't want to put up their hand necessarily and say, hey, I'm a, I'm a feminist. Mm -hmm. And then their role models wonderfully model this behaviour. Last year alone, we had Katy Perry saying, I'm not a feminist. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, um, I'm not a feminist. You know, one, one after another, we, we hear these public figures um, who, who young girls admire and, and look up to saying they're not feminists. And, and none of this paints a very 
attractive picture for them. And then you see women like uh, the creator of Girls, Lena Dunham, or the Facebook executive, Sheryl Sandberg, who's written the book Leaning In. Lean In. Lean In. Yeah. Uh, absolutely torn to shreds for things like uh, Lena Dunham. It was for the fact that black people weren't represented in Girls. Uh, Sheryl Sandberg, it was the notion that she was too privileged to speak out. And you, you say that it's, it's the suggestion that she's not speaking for all women, so how dare she speak at all? How do women, how do prominent women overcome that kind of reaction? I guess just by continuing to speak, mm. probably. Um, I think it is, in its own curious way, a, a form of silencing to, to insist that every time a woman opens her mouth, she represents a whole gender. She can't. And I think, I think Julia Gillard suffered from that and, and from the weight of expectations that we all put on her. She was our first feminist prime minister. She was our first female prime minister. And uh, we wanted her to be the perfect feminist and we wanted her to be the perfect prime minister and we wanted to be able to agree and applaud everything she did. But she's a person. And surely the ultimate result of, of feminism is, is that women get to be people, just like men. Uh, generating a bit of discussion in the last day or so has been um, Anne Summers' piece um, uh, suggesting or, or suggesting that some of uh, Labor's uh, cabinet ministers should be ashamed for not stepping down themselves, people like Penny Wong who eventually supported Kevin Rudd. Is that an extension of that way of thinking, do you think? Yeah, I think it could be. You know, Jermaine Greer says that to be a feminist is to understand that you're a woman above everything else. But I think, um, I'm not sure if it was Penny Wong who, who said, well, I'm not just representing women, I'm representing people. And uh, I think it's provoked so many extreme reactions in so many of us, the events of the last couple of days. And, you know, perhaps people do find themselves craving some sort of weird, warped form of revenge. But a mass exodus from, a mass fe female exodus from Labour, I don't think is is really going to help anybody. And, you know, the notion that, uh, what, what, what do we want to do now? Do we want to sabotage labour? It's, it's sort of what my parents used to say, cutting off your nose to, to spite your face. Um, what's, the, what's the sort of supreme feminist solution to the current situation we find ourselves in? Is it an Abbott victory? I'm not sure that it is. Now, Gillard's, Gillard said in, in her speech on Wednesday, what, I'm, what I am absolutely confident of is it will be easier for the next woman and the woman after that, and I am proud of that. Are you as confident as Gillard? Oh, I wish I was. Um, I, I don't know if, if the... I mean, it's certainly what has happened, I think, over, with the events of the last few years is it's... Uh, it's maybe made us start having a conversation about these things again. And maybe that's a really, really good thing. But the circumstances of, of Gillard's entire prime ministership and the circumstances in which she was removed, I, I don't know if they're going to encourage more women to go into politics. I don't know if they're going to discourage people from appointing women into, into positions of power because that's a sort of horrible, horrible interpretation that can be made. Um, we had this female prime minister and... People didn't like her, so let's maybe, as Tony Abbott said, men are better suited by physio physiology or temperament <laughs> to, to exercise command. I mean, there's a number of interpretations that can be made about the whole thing. Um, I certainly hope it'll get easier. And, uh, you know, maybe she is a trailblazer, but I I'm sure she is a trailblazer. But there is this very disconcerting pattern that Julia Baird identifies in her book, Media Tarts, about female politicians being, I think she says, dumped and discredited with an intensity that surprised even the most experienced observers. And I think we've just witnessed the ultimate example of that. You speak of a resilient feminism. Um, you say that one of the messages of the misogyny speech is that we're not done with feminism yet. What is the ultimate benchmark of success? When are we done? When are we done? I think we're done probably when we can stop talking about it. Maybe there is a time in the future when we actually are able to retire the word and, and just all be, all be people. Um, and not, I mean, there was actually there was a lovely piece today by Annabel Crabb in, in The Drum who says that, are we there yet? Well, we're there when Julia Gillard or whoever is no longer the female prime minister, they are just the prime minister. And I think that's surely what we're aspiring towards. That sounds quite lovely. I fear that we're not quite there yet, but in the meantime, let's talk about it with the audience, shall we? 
Thank you, Anna. That was fantastic. And um, I think we'll throw to some questions now because I'm sure that we've got a lot to get through. Who wants to kick it off? Um, thank you for that discussion and for the quarterly essay. Um, I found they both really resonated with me in the discussion of um, sexuality for a young woman because that's something that I struggle with as a feminist, but feeling very sex positive as well. Um, and with the judgment that comes with that, and even though I feel very strong about it myself, that I can be promiscuous and be a feminist and be proud of that, it, the response from friends and pretty much everyone is, is generally still, there's the underlying um, idea of a slut. It's really hard to escape from. And I just wonder how you think that can be addressed with friends who otherwise are fully supportive and wonderful, but just maybe don't understand that on the same level. I suppose you just need to have those, those conversations with them and uh, ex explain yourself. And, you know, I completely agree. I, I don't see that feminism and, and sex positivity need to be mutually exclusive at, at all um, without advocating a mass movement of sort of rabid promiscuity for the, for the feminist cause necessarily. Um, I, I think, you know, live your life. Get on with it. And if your friends judge you, well, maybe they're not such great friends after all. Hi, thank you very much. That was very um, enlightening and interesting and lots to think about. I'm not sure whether you'll think that um, this reflection or question is an overreaction, so please tell me if you think it is. I enjoyed um, Lee Sales and Annabelle Crabbe's coverage too on the night of the long needles, I think Guy Rundle called it. Um, but I did notice that Lee Sales, when she was talking about um, the difficulty that women have being both politicians and having families, she said to Annabelle something like, oh, and let's, give, let's not forget, let's give a shout out to our husbands who are at home minding our children. And I thought, in the 21st century, are male parents, partners, minding their children? Have you got any thoughts on that? Thanks. Yeah, I was quite I was quite struck by that too. And um, you know, I'm sitting here in a situation where my partner's in Brisbane minding our children at, at the moment. Um, now, I was quite struck by that remark for the, for the reason for, for two reasons. One was one part of me thought, yes, yay, great. It's it's wonderful to see these women out out there, and they are they are actually reflecting on the reality of of what it takes to be a prominent woman in public life. It does, if you've got children, require a very supportive spouse, and and maybe that does need to be acknowledged. On the other hand, there's a part of me that recoils every time a man demands special brownie points and reinforcement for um, what is frequently called babysitting when it's his own children. <laughs> and um, maybe there was a, a, a sort of slight, uh, slight overtone of that. Um, but, but on the whole, I, I looked at those two women, I thought, yeah, you, you, you're great. You're great. And it's wonderful that you're out there and you're having this conversation. And bless you for having supportive partners who look after your kids. And I think Annabelle Crabb made the point, and I think it's a really significant point, that uh, a really large aspect of, uh, about the underrepresentation of women in politics has to do with the fact that it's a really obscenely demanding life and you can't really do it and have, have, a, have a family unless you've got a prodigiously supportive husband. And I, I, I think that's a conversation that does need to be, be had. And, you know, if, if Lee Sales and Annabelle Crabb are going to have it in that context, then, then I'm all for it. Some would say that it's important to mention the fact that children exist, yeah. um, that, yeah. that um, to deride the notion of the mummy blogger, for example, uh, is to sort of suggest that it's not an important story and it doesn't need to be injected into the conversation. Yeah, it's, it's funny how you just put the word mummy in front of anything and it immediately it sounds a bit ludicrous, like, you know, mummy porn, mummy blogging. Yes. It's somehow demeaned just by, just by the presence of mummy. But, but mummy bloggers do uh, perform a really important critical, critical, critical function and it's, uh, I think it's one of the wonderful benefits of the internet that these conversations and these connections have been allowed to, to form and flourish. Okay. We've got a few hands floating way down the back and right up the front here. Um, very interesting talk. Um, my question is, what do you think has to happen in Australia? What do women have to do in Australia to get the country to catch up with the rest of the world? Um, there are several 
uh, heads of women, heads of state, world leaders, um, Chancellor Merkel, uh, Danish Prime Minister, the Icelandics often have a female head of state. There are many others. And what happens there isn't what we've seen in Australia. Three years of media pack rape, really, of mm -hmm. the whole concept of wo a woman being a head of state. So what do you think has to happen? I remember 40 years ago um, at uni and forums where we talked about what Jermaine Greer was saying. It's 40 years on mm. and we still seem to be having, the in same. some ways, a very lame conversation. So what do women really have to do to, to get things to change in Australia? Wow, if only I, if only I knew. <laughs> Tell do you have us, any, Anna. Do you have any thoughts? Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, look, there are those who will argue that uh, affirmative action... and uh, we've, we've seen in, in the Labor Party when they established sort of female quotas it had a really clearly positive impact on the number of female politicians there were. Um, there are those who, who are very opposed to the notion of affirmative action because it somehow under, undermines the credibility of any woman who makes it into a position of power. Um, but maybe there is something to be said in, in Julia Gillard's notion that you just have to change the images in people's heads. They just need to see them there and then it becomes a more palatable reality. This may be true. I think um, it's uh, confronting to think it or, or say it, but I think we can affect a lot of changes on, on the level of our own lives too in, in what we demand of ourselves and demand of our, of our men folk and what we teach our daughters and what we, what we say is acceptable, what we let, what we let go by. Um, you know, in that, in that YouTube clip of General Morrison, was it? Um, you know, he, he made some remark about, about that. What you, can you remember what that remark was? No. It was about, basically I'm it was about, and it's, it's sort of the same thing. Like, you know, you're sitting in a restaurant and you see Nigella Lawson getting strangled by her husband. Mm. Um, do you step in or do you just let it go by? And by, by stepping in and saying, no, this is not right, are you, again, deploying that, uh, that terrible gender card? Um, and now that's clearly an extreme example, but there mm. are many small examples, I think, in, in, our, in our daily lives. Now, I was giving a talk a couple of weeks ago at the Sydney Writers' Festival, and at the end, it was about motherhood memoirs, and I've, I've written a mother, motherhood memoir, and I was speaking to Monica Duck, who's written a terrific motherhood memoir. And at the end of it, a woman put up her hand and she said, yes, but what are we going to do about it? Um, the men just expect us to do everything and I'm going away for the weekend and I've just done all the cooking and I've put it in the freezer. What are we going to do about it? <laughs> and I just thought, well, get him to do some cooking, you know. And maybe it's... Uh, clearly it's not always that easy and people are in, in bad relationships and, and, and so on, but... But I think we also have to make demands of, of, the, of the people around us and of the men around us and, and ask how we're living our lives and if we're really living those feminist ideals or, or not on a personal level. Now, some will, say that <clears throat> some will say that's blaming the victim. I don't think it is. I think, um, and I think this is, we're talking about the culture and, and the culture is our shared project. Up the back. Good evening and thanks very much for a great conversation. Um, I've really enjoyed your perspective, particularly on Julia Gillard's um, Prime Ministership. Um, <clears throat> I was just wondering, um, given um, the turmoil that she's endured over the last number of years, how do you feel um, history will look back on her Prime Ministership? Because, yep, she did a lot of great things in her time. Um, and, you know, as this whole situation washes through, I'd be interested to know what your thoughts might be, just how we look back on her prime ministership. Yeah, well, I had a sense of it, and maybe it's my own wishful thinking, but as she was delivering that, that very beautiful and, and, to my mind, very moving and gracious speech of, of concession, I, I, I sort of felt I had a vision of her um, in, in posterity, and, and I, my, my own feeling is that history is only going to smile upon her in, in all sorts of ways. down the front here, thanks. I just wanted to bring up the um, this ridiculous situation that happened about the knitting and what we can do about that. And what, what is your, you know, what are your thoughts about how we can deal with that absurd continuing exploitation of what we like what anyone wants to do with their own hobbies. Yeah, <laughs> I think everyone's entitled to their own hobbies. Um, I think uh, 
It's a funny thing with Julia Gillard. I think she was so sort of... She, she became so good at not deploying the gender card that, that when it became time for her to start reaching out to women or to women voters, she some, sometimes did it in quite a, perhaps a slightly clumsy way. And I think we heard that in the, in the Blue Ties speech. Um, perhaps we saw it in, in the knitting photos. And it's almost as if, okay, it's, it's almost as if she's, she's reading from the same alien phrase book that Kevin Rudd uses for his own vocabulary. Um, you know... <laughs> This is what humans say, and this is what this is what women do. And I mean, to my mind, sometimes those gestures did seem a bit heavy-handed and and clumsy. Um, but I think for for the very good reason that she sort of schooled herself to be one of the blo one of the blokes and was very very comfortable. I think in a blokey context, and and when she stepped out of that, many people did register it as inauthentic inauthentic, regardless of whether or not she was a very passionate knitter in, in her own private life, which, which clearly she is. There's also that suggestion that she, Gillard, in many ways, does not represent the typical woman mm. uh, in that, you know, she w was living in a de facto relationship, the empty fruit bowl, you know, she doesn't have children. She dedicated her life to her political career and if she can't make it... Does that mean no, no woman can. can? It's ludicrous, isn't it? I mean, all the, all the criticism of, of, of Gillard or all the inferences that are made about her personal life and her private life, she doesn't have children, she's barren. You know, if she did have children, she'd be a bad mother because she wasn't at home looking after them. You, mm -hmm. you can't win. She you couldn't can't win. win. If, you, if you're a woman in a leadership position, if you're, if, you're, if you're strong, you're seen as a shrew, you're seen as a scold. If you're not, if you're too conciliatory, you're seen as weak. I, I still think culturally we have women backed into a corner. How, how is she supposed to perform? Well, well, she chose a particular way of doing it, which was just putting her head down and, and getting on with it. And, and there is, um, despite its limitations, I think there is something admirable about that. Mm. We have time for one more question, perhaps. Thanks very much. I'm the second male brave enough to say something. Um, I think this has been absolutely wonderful. I'm a great admirer of Julia Gillard and I was in tears last night or the night before. Mm. Uh, you keep saying about what we would say to what you as mothers would say to your daughters. What about the boys? Yeah, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a lovely question. I'm actually the mother of two boys. And when my, my second child was born a boy, I said to mum, I said, oh, no, it's the end of that, you know, the great feminist project that you imbued in me and my sister. My sister. And she said, no, it's not. This is the feminist project. Yeah. You know, it's about bringing up great boys and great girls. And um, I, I hope that uh, that's, that's one of the things that really concerns me about lots of the cultural messages that are getting through now. Like gonzo pornography, for instance, I think has a much greater effect on our boys and then they enact, they enact those messages and those behaviours upon our girls. But, but I think absolutely boys are, boys are critical to it. And what I would have loved to have seen is, is more men actually speaking out against this sexism, against this misogyny. When they do, it's very powerful. And um, I, I wish it happened more frequently. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. Anna, thank you so much. I'm sure we'd all love to drag you to the pub and keep talking to you about this for another three hours or so. Um, but thank you so much for what is an incredibly timely essay and it's an incredibly clear-eyed look at a very complex issue and something that we're going to be talking about for years to come in regards to Gillard. The quarterly essay is up the back of the room on sale. Um, readings are up the back of the room if anyone's interested and Anna will be signing some copies. Um, so you might be able to throw a few more questions her way. Um, would you please join me in thanking Anna Goldsworthy? Thanks Sophie. Thank you everybody.